Thank you very much, Clark. Thank you, Skip Rutherford, for having me here. I also wanted to acknowledge members of Richard Arnold's family who are here, Kay Arnold, his wife, the Honorable Morris Arnold, his brother. Delighted to have you and, and all of you here. Let me begin with a few words about how I came to write the book and why. Judge Richard Arnold was a rarity among modern federal judges, in part because of his reputation. He was a national figure, widely admired by Supreme Court justices and others, and because his admirers included both liberals and conservatives. When President Clinton considered Arnold to replace Justice Blackmun on the Supreme Court, that support from both sides of the political spectrum was evident. It may be that as President Obama considers his replacements for the Supreme Court that we may learn something from Richard Arnold. I also wrote the book, however, because it is important for the public to have a broader understanding of the work of the lower federal courts. Less than 1% of all federal court cases end up in the Supreme Court. Federal judges, like Richard Arnold, are effectively the final word on the many contentious social and political issues that end up in the federal courts. There are nearly 200 Court of Appeals judges. There are nearly 600 trial court judges. We rarely hear about their work because it is often overshadowed by interest in the Supreme Court. What I tried to do in this book is to select from among the hundreds of opinions to illustrate Arnold's legacy and the important work of the federal courts. For this talk, I focus on two areas of that legacy. One is school desegregation in Little Rock, and the other is the debate over unpublished opinions. Before I begin, I wanted to show you some images from the book that I think you might enjoy seeing. This photo did not actually make it into the book, but as the uh, youth suggests there, it's from a, a very young age. We, you heard earlier from Clark that one, one of Richard Arnold's uh, traits, or at least that he was widely known for, was his intelligence. And he not only graduated first in his class at Yale College, but also first, first in his class at Harvard Law School. This is a photograph from Harvard Law School. Uh, this is the Law Review from 1960. There's Richard Arnold. There's a future justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Antonin Scalia. And as we know, Richard Arnold uh, graduated first in that class, just barely edging out Scalia for that particular honor. As part of his process of uh, education for Richard Arnold and, and his experiences, one of the turning points was his clerkship for Justice William Brennan. This photograph shows Justice William Brennan and Richard Arnold in Brennan's chambers in 1960. The occasion is the beginning of Richard Arnold's clerkship. He's also just become a member of the Arkansas Bar, and he has a Supreme Court Justice, William Brennan, to swear him in. It was an interesting time to be in Washington and at the Supreme Court at a relatively early era in what we know of as the Warren Court. Some of you may remember these billboards that could be seen throughout the United States, in part as a reaction to Brown versus Board of Education, but also as a reaction to some of the other decisions of the Warren Court. And you can see the message there, Save Our Republic, Impeach Earl Warren. Richard Arnold could see some of these billboards on his way to work for Justice Brennan in, in 1960. So this was part of his background and his experience before he was appointed to the federal bench on two occasions by Jimmy Carter. So when he was at Harvard Law School, though, in 1957, he found the violent uproar at Central High School in Little Rock both distressing and personally embarrassing. When he reached the Eighth Circuit more than two decades later, Arnold found himself a central figure in the ongoing Little Rock school desegregation cases. After Cooper versus Aaron was decided in 1958, the Supreme Court did not involve itself again in the Little Rock school cases, leaving final resolution of numerous appeals exclusively to the Eighth Circuit. Beginning in 1982, the most critical decisions concerning desegregation in Little Rock 
bore Arnold's signature. Arnold's last opinion in the Little Rock School cases, written a few months before his death in September 2004, signaled the close of nearly 50 years of federal court involvement. By then, the Little Rock schools had been under federal court supervision longer than any other school system in the nation. Before Richard Arnold's involvement, Little Rock schools had already been under federal court supervision for 25 years. When Arnold joined the Little Rock school cases, desegregation, elimination of the use of government power to enforce segregation had largely been accomplished. The remaining intractable question was the extent to which integration could be achieved in the face of white flight and in an urban school district with a majority black student enrollment. Arnold sat on 28 appeals of school desegregation issues and would write 16 opinions in those cases. Other Eighth Circuit judges seem to have deferred to Arnold's views, not only because of his intellectual prowess, but perhaps also because he was viewed as a representative of Arkansas on the court. He was closest to the ground among the appellate judges with an extensive background in Arkansas politics. Because of Arnold's long and deep involvement, the Little Rock School cases provide unique insight into the development and application of his judicial method and philosophy. Although he was described as a powerful, liberal-leaning intellectual, it is not easy to characterize Arnold as either a liberal or a conservative in the Little Rock cases. There were three key decisions during the course of Arnold's tenure that I want to mention briefly. During his tenure, the, the three important developments that I'll mention shaped the course of the litigation and the ultimate resolution for the Little Rock School District. The first is a 1985 en banc decision rejecting the district court's order of consolidation. The second is a 1990 panel opinion rejecting the district court's modification of a settlement agreement. And the final one, uh, Judge Arnold's last in these cases, affirmed a finding of partial unitary status over the objection of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Beginning with the consolidation issue, from 1959 until 1982, the Little Rock School District operated under successive desegregation plans, the details of which were frequently litigated. In 1982, however, the Little Rock School District adopted a new strategy to achieve integration. The district filed a lawsuit against two neighboring school districts, the North Little Rock School District and the Pulaski County School District, as well as the state of Arkansas and the State Board of Education asking the federal district court to order interdistrict relief. Although all three school districts operated under federal court desegregation decrees, the Little Rock School District sought to force consolidation of the three districts as the only feasible resolution of the problem of segregation. This lawsuit became the main strategy for desegregation of the Little Rock schools. By the close of the 1970s, the Little Rock area schools had come to resemble northern urban schools with a self-contained inner city majority black school district surrounded by suburban school districts that were predominantly white. Federal District Judge Henry Woods ordered the consolidation of the three school districts in 1985, but the Eighth Circuit reversed. The Eighth Circuit reversed that decision uh, in which Arnold supported that result and wrote a separate concurring opinion. Arnold wrote that he approved completely of the court's decision not to order consolidation of the three school districts. Although he noted that consolidation was within the judicial power of the United States and that upon proper proof he would support it, he believed the extent of the interdistrict violations did not meet that standard. Arnold wrote, consolidation would mean destruction of three popularly governed units of local government and substitution in their stead of one judicially created and judicially supervised school district. Arnold believed consolidation to be, quote, a drastic step that should be reserved for clearer cases. Instead, Arnold wrote, our task as judges is not to force these school districts to do what we think is right or socially good, but to apply the law to the facts 
and announce the result, whatever it may be. Judge Gerald Haney, another member of that court, attributed the majority's decision to reverse the consolidation largely to Arnold's influence. Two decades later, Judge Haney told me, Richard was not only a great judge, but a great human being. And we all had such respect for him that I think we gave an awful lot of weight to his views on the matter. It was his feeling that we really didn't have the precedent in our favor in terms of adopting Judge Woods's view that the school districts should be consolidated, even if that might have been the most effective and in the long run probably the best chance of having a long-term integrative effect. But I agreed with Richard and I didn't do so unwillingly, partially because I had such great respect for him as a person and as a judge. The most difficult issue for the court, according to Haney, was whether Judge Woods was correct in concluding that the only way to achieve a reasonable degree of integration was to consolidate the schools. We all agreed at the time. We thought that Judge Woods had gone further than he ought to have gone. But in retrospect, I don't know whether we were right or whether we were wrong. Obviously, it was very difficult to achieve any high degree of integration within the Little Rock School District. So I think Judge Woods was very disappointed in our decision. We thought we were doing the right thing at the time. If ever a district would have been well served by consolidation, that might have been the district. The second point at which Arnold's intervention was decisive involved the interdistrict settlement agreement. With consolidation ruled out by the Eighth Circuit, the three school districts negotiated a settlement among themselves and the state of Arkansas. As part of this agreement, the state legislature would authorize $109 million to fund desegregation programs, primarily in the Little Rock School District. This agreement would limit the state's liability to a finite amount and dismiss it from the case. Judge Henry Woods rejected the proposed settlement. He did so on the ground that it did not go far enough to achieve desegregation in the Little Rock School District and that the state's funding would prove inadequate to justify dismissing it from the case. Judge Woods then entered a modified consent degree to which all the parties to the litigation objected. Among other things, the decree created the Office of Metropolitan Supervisor with management powers over all three school districts. In his opinion for the Eighth Circuit, Judge Arnold rejected the district court's modification and held that Judge Woods should have approved the settlement plan. The parties had not asked for this kind of supervision and indeed had presented a settlement plan that did not require it. Arnold expressed a fundamentally different attitude toward the proposed settlement than had Judge Woods. Arnold wrote, the most important fact about the present appeals is that they arise out of settlements agreed to by all the parties. The law strongly favors settlements. Courts should hospitably receive them. This may be especially true in the present context. A protracted, highly divisive, even bitter litigation, any lasting solution to which necessarily depends on the good faith and cooperation of all the parties. The Arkansas legislature and Governor Bill Clinton provided funds without being ordered by any court to do so, Arnold noted. He said, quote, enactment of this settlement bill without precedent so far as we know in any other state was a significant step towards erasing the legacy of lawlessness that had marked the state of Arkansas's initial reaction to the constitutional requirement of equal integrated education. With the settlement recognized by the courts, the parties should be able to devote more energy to education and less to litigation. Following the Eighth Circuit's second major reversal, Woods removed himself from the school cases. Woods said that the appeals court, quote, had blocked any substantial progress toward a solution of the manifold problems of these school districts. Woods wrote in his recusal order, whatever the plan finally mandated by the Court of Appeals, those who take as their part delay and obstruction will have won. I am unable to successfully implement a plan to bring equity to the children of this county under the restrictions imposed by the Court of Appeals. Perhaps the application of a fresh mind and the perspective of another judge 
can find hope in a situation which I perceive as hopeless. In his lengthy recusal order, Judge Woods also recalled the Eighth Circuit's decision five years earlier to reverse his order of consolidation. And here's what Judge Woods wrote about that. I still believe that the solution which makes common sense for the children in this community is consolidation of the school districts. I believe that had the Court of Appeals affirmed that decision in 1984, we would now be several years into a productive workable plan. Henry Woods and Richard Arnold enjoyed a professional relationship and personal friendship for many years preceding their involvement in the Little Rock School cases. Arnold and Woods worked closely together in then Governor Dale Bumper's successful campaign for the Senate in 1974. Later, the two appeared at a hearing together for confirmation to federal judgeships. Henry Woods to the District Court and Richard Arnold to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. That's what this photograph shows here from that hearing, along with Arkansas Senators David Pryor and Dale Bumpers. Both were confirmed on the same day. There is no evidence, however, that the dispute over school desegregation disrupted their friendship. In his final written opinion in the Little Rock School cases, Arnold affirmed a grant of partial unitary status to the Little Rock School District by Judge William R. Wilson, Jr., the third district judge to preside over the inter-district litigation begun in 1982. The district court determined that the Little Rock School District had substantially complied in good faith with its obligations under the settlement agreement. Some monitoring of student achievement would continue, hence the designation of partial unitary status but the practical effect was an end to the inter-district litigation. It was an opinion of historic significance. With substantial court supervision of the Little Rock schools nearing an end, it is likely that few will agree on what the litigation accomplished or on the significance of Arnold's role. Considering only numeric ratios, Little Rock schools have experienced resegregation. The Little Rock School District has seen a complete reversal in its student makeup since 1957. This phenomenon is consistent with developments in many other urban school districts. In Arnold's years on the Eighth Circuit, unlike the prominent national stage in 1957, these cases never again centered specifically on Central High School. Arnold, it seems, was not even sure where in Little Rock the famous high school was located on the occasion of a visit to Little Rock by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Arnold asked if there was anything in Little Rock she would like to see before he drove her back to the airport. Yes, she said, I would like to see Little Rock Central High School. Arnold readily complied with O'Connor's request, but during the drive he had to call his secretary for directions, a story Justice O'Connor later recounted with some amusement. A second legacy I would like to mention has to do with the topic of open courts and the debate over unpublished opinions. One theme of Arnold's years on the bench was his concern for transparency and public accountability in the judiciary. He knew that most of the work of federal courts occurred out of the press spotlight, and it was this work, he said, that affects the public more than they know. Arnold believed that judges, like other government officials, were public servants who worked for the people. He understood and said publicly that the ongoing operation of the federal courts was dependent upon the consent of the governed. One practice bothered Arnold in particular. Federal courts of appeal issue over 80% of their decisions in what they term unpublished form. An opinion bearing the notation, not for publication, means that the court has not authorized it for official publication in the federal reporter. Often, these opinions are unsigned, per curiam, and relatively short. In some instances, the decision is one sentence or merely one word, affirmed. For the rest, these opinions seldom contain an extensive recitation of facts or analysis of the applicable law. Unpublished is a misnomer. Although designated not for publication, these opinions have long been readily available from the court itself or through electronic databases for a fee. 
An opinion sent for official publication, by contrast, would appear in the Federal Reporter and be available in libraries. Officially published opinions typically contain extensive recitation of the facts of the case and apply those facts to a usually more extensive evaluation of the relevant law. Defenders of the practice, almost all of them federal appellate judges, say that it is necessary because the federal judiciary could otherwise not cope with the caseload. Unpublished, non-precedential opinions are reserved for cases in which the judges agree that no new issues are presented. Both the facts of the case to be decided, as well as the law applicable to it, are routine in the court's experience. The decisions are merely uncontroversial applications of established legal doctrine that do not make new law. Dealing with such cases in an abbreviated opinion that does not form precedent for future cases, the argument goes, frees judges to devote more time to matters of greater legal urgency. Most opinions designated not for publication are unanimous, but one study revealed that 24% of unpublished decisions issued by appeals courts are not only not unanimous, but also that various judges disagree so much that one writes a dissenting opinion. The federal courts of appeal increased their use of this practice in the closing decades of the 20th century from 37% of all cases decided in 1977 to just over 80% by 2000. The number of such unpublished decisions accounts today for an astounding proportion of all cases decided by federal appeals courts, four out of every five appeals. Arnold worried that increasing uses of unpublished opinions meant the judiciary could avoid responsibility for outcomes, and he was not alone in his concern. One of Arnold's objections was that such abbreviated decisions ran the risk of not fully representing the decision process or properly explaining to the losing party why he or she had lost the case. Arnold had well-known views about how all judicial opinions should be written. Most importantly, he believed opinions should be written for the losing side of the case so that the person, not the lawyer, could understand the reasons for losing. I think about litigants a lot, Arnold once said. The losing litigants are the people who need to understand that they have been heard that a reasoning creature of some kind has evaluated their argument and come to some sort of defensible conclusion about it. They won't like it, they won't enjoy losing, but I hope they will have a sense that they have been heard. And so it's important how opinions are written. I worry that sometimes our opinions are not living up to that standard. But what Arnold really objected to was the rule followed in most federal courts of appeal, including the Eighth Circuit, preventing parties from citing to unpublished opinions. The Eighth Circuit's rule read, unpublished opinions are not precedent and parties generally should not cite them. In other words, any opinion not officially published was unusable beyond that individual case. From nearly the moment Arnold joined the Eighth Circuit in 1980, he sought to change the court's rule on non-precedential opinions. Beginning in 1983, Arnold raised the issue before the Eighth Circuit judges by way of a motion to change the rule in order to allow the parties to cite to such opinions. For the next 10 years, as he would say, his motions never received a second. As he wrote to a fellow judge, quote, there is absolutely no justification for unpublished opinions unless we abolish the rule that they cannot be cited as precedent. It's not so much a concern to me whether they are mailed to West, a legal publisher, as whether they are available to the bar and the public to remind the courts of what they have done in the past. As I have said in public several times, the rule of our courts on this subject is an abomination. It's fairly strong language from Richard Arnold to use the word abomination. Arnold seems to have been looking for a case to make precisely this point, and in the early months of 2000, he found it. Anastasov versus United States was a small tax case. It did not involve Arnold's great cause, the Bill of Rights. 
and in fact was later dismissed as moot when the government agreed to refund the amount the taxpayer had claimed she had overpaid, about $6,000. But Harvard Law professor Frank Michaelman, who had been a classmate of Arnold's at both Yale College and Harvard Law School, termed this case Arnold's single boldest stroke of constitutional interpretation, reminiscent of John Marshall, the great Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The case itself was one of many routine taxpayer lawsuits for a relatively small amount of money. Faye Anastasoff sued the Internal Revenue Service in federal district court because the IRS refused to consider her claim for a tax refund. The IRS received her claim one day after the three-year claim period expired, but Anastasoff had mailed the refund request before the end of the claim period. The IRS took the position that the date of receipt by the IRS and not the date of mailing determined whether the claim would be considered. A federal district court agreed with the IRS, but eight years earlier, in an unpublished ruling in another case, an Eighth Circuit panel had held in favor of the IRS on this precise question. It was the only case in the Eighth Circuit to have considered it. The Supreme Court had not addressed the issue, an illustration of the numerous questions of law on which lower federal courts can and do diverge without Supreme Court oversight. The earlier case was an unpublished opinion. The problem Judge Arnold faced was that the Eighth Circuit followed the practice that no panel of three judges could overrule a prior case. If a precedent were to be overruled, that action required the full Eighth Circuit sitting on bond. Instead, Arnold ruled in favor of the IRS because, he said, the court was bound to follow the earlier case even though it was unpublished and the Eighth Circuit rule specified that it was not precedent. But Arnold needed a justification to disregard his court's rule on non-precedential opinions. He resolved the problem by holding that the Eighth Circuit's rule, insofar as it would allow us to avoid the precedential effect of our prior decisions, purports to expand the judicial power beyond the bounds of Article III and is therefore unconstitutional. Arnold's opinion in Anastasov quickly set off a national debate. Academics, judges, lawyers soon filled the pages of legal publications with arguments for and against Arnold's ruling, and many called for courts to change the restrictions on citation. The reaction to Arnold's bold step engendered such national debate that it threatened to overshadow Arnold's other landmark decisions in the memory of the legal community. But it did not remain law within the Eighth Circuit. It was vacated as moot because the IRS agreed to pay the claim. Richard Arnold was vindicated in 2006 when the Supreme Court mandated a rule change for all federal appellate courts requiring that they allow citation of unpublished opinions. Although all unpublished opinions uh, issued after January 1, 2007 may now be cited, the rule does not take any position as to whether an unpublished decision has precedential value. Tony Morrow of the Legal Times attributed the new rule largely to Arnold. Though the propriety of an essentially secret judicial process has been debated for years, the catalyst for change was Judge Richard Arnold's opinion in Anastasov. Arnold died in 2004, three years before the Supreme Court's rule change went into effect but he knew the debate had continued. The Department of Justice and a U.S. Judicial Conference Advisory Committee had recommended in 2003 the enactment of a rule to allow lawyers to cite unpublished opinions in all appeals courts. The House Judiciary Committee held oversight hearings on the question, and in the interim, several circuits modified their own rules. As these developments were underway, the National Law Journal acknowledged that Richard Arnold's opinion in Anastasov had, quote, pushed the judiciary toward a rule change, an article Arnold carefully preserved in a scrapbook. Richard Arnold frequently spoke and wrote about how he believed judges should behave and why it was important for judges to uphold high standards. Next to doing right, Arnold said, the great object in the administration of justice should be to give public satisfaction. How? 
In addition to doing right, one should also strive to appear to be doing right, to do right in such a way as to command the public's respect. Arnold was an unusually open judge in other ways. Most revealing of Arnold's character were his responses to letters he received from members of the public who wrote to him. In one example, an elderly South Dakota couple wrote to Arnold as chief judge concerning their son's imprisonment. They did not have a lawyer and did not know how to raise their son's claims before a federal court. Arnold wrote back, patiently explaining the process, and I would like to read a very short excerpt from that letter. I have read and considered your letter. As I understand it, your claim is that your son was convicted and sentenced to a lengthy prison term as a result of the illegal acts of South Dakota police and prosecutors. Further, you claim that the South Dakota Supreme Court has thoroughly misrepresented the law in addressing your son's challenge to his conviction and sentence. I have no authority to investigate state officials or to review the merits of the South Dakota Supreme Court's decisions. The proper remedy, once your son has exhausted his avenues of appeal in the state court system, is to file a habeas petition in federal district court. I hope this information will be of assistance to you. Few judges would go to such lengths to inform a member of the public of the complicated processes of habeas jurisdiction. In another example, Arnold responded to a letter about a criminal case that was still on appeal within the Arkansas state courts. He understood that most non-lawyers had difficulty understanding when and how federal courts might review state criminal convictions. So he took the time to explain it. And he wrote, the case you refer to is in the state courts. My court, which is a federal court, has only limited authority to review state court convictions. And we cannot exercise even that authority until the conviction becomes final in the state courts. If the Arkansas Supreme Court affirms the conviction, it is possible for the defendant to file a petition for habeas corpus in a federal district court. Assuming certain procedural requirements are met, the federal courts will then review any federal constitutional issue raised with respect to the conviction. That's about all I can properly say at this point. I'm sorry this letter is not more helpful. It is not possible to summarize a judicial career like Richard Arnold's in one hour or even in one book, as my publisher reminded me when they asked me to cut one third of the manuscript <laughs> for the final product that you see. But it is important to strive for a broader public understanding of the work of the federal judiciary. And most of this work is done outside of the spotlight of the Supreme Court, where Richard Arnold spent his career. I would be happy to answer any questions and engage in further discussion. Questions uh, for Professor Price? Yes, sir. Let's get a microphone right over here. She'll get you the microphone. Okay. Thank you, Professor Price, for speaking to us. And uh, I had a question for you, maybe on a more personal level. If you have a, a uh, young law student coming in that seeks your advice and counsel as they prepare to enter their legal career, what's the best advice you would give to a person now? I think the best advice I would give is, is, the, is the, the best advice I received as I was getting ready to graduate from law school, and that is uh, try, to do a, try to pursue a judicial clerkship before you begin the process of representing clients. So whether you're working for circuit court, state court judge, federal judge, that was, for me, a real formative experience. Obviously, it, it resulted in uh, a, a, an admiration of someone's career that I ended up writing about. But I think when I talk to other law students who have uh, sort of graduated and pursued the same, I think they agree with you. It gives you an opportunity to see, uh, for the most part, in a very, very inspiring way, uh, how the judiciary works, both federal and state, and before you have the burden of representing a client, when a client is, is relying upon your skills for their livelihood. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. The country 
is contemplating that we will have a new judge on the Supreme Court. The person who will nominate that person is an African American who is highly respected for his constitutional astuteness, skills, and performance in interpreting the Constitution of the United States. Do you feel that the nomination of a person who has taught it, lived it, experienced it, the nomination that they nominate for confirmation by the Senate will be measured by the scholarliness of the nominee, the temperament of the nominee, because of who nominated them, and that that court that that person will serve on will be serving at a time when law decisions are global, primarily related to human rights rather than civil rights in the continental United States. Thank you. The, the question is a fascinating one for Supreme Court watchers, which is to say that we have, it's a historic presidency, and I think we can expect from that, or the expectations are high for historic Supreme Court nominations. I should say, by the way, that along with my uh, co-clerk Price Marshall, who's here, Judge Marshall is here, we uh, were in class. We went to Harvard Law School and were third-year students when the new president of the United States was a first-year student. At least I didn't know him when we were there, but it's, it's a little bit sobering to say that one of the younger law students around is now president of the United States. I've been thinking quite a bit about judicial appointments, and I certainly can't predict anything that President Obama would do. He, it, it, you're absolutely right to say that he himself is, is very learned in the law and has thought deeply about these issues and about justice issues. And in, in, in some ways, President Clinton was in a similar position. He had been a law professor, was trained in the law, and also devoted, was very hands-on in terms of selecting his judicial nominees. So it'll be uh, it, very interesting to, to watch that process unfold. Questions? Let me ask a question that I think everybody uh, would, would like to hear your thoughts on, which is your insight into President Clinton's consideration of Judge Arnold uh, to the Supreme Court and uh, any thoughts about that nomination process, why and why not? Well, as I write in the book, this is primarily Richard Arnold's chance on the Supreme Court was for Justice Harry Blackmun's seat, which was open in 1994. And as you know, or will recall, that from what President Clinton himself said, Richard Arnold was very much in contention for that seat. In fact, when the decision was made and President Clinton had a press conference announcing who it was going to be and that it was going to be Stephen Breyer, one of the first things he said was, I wanted to nominate Richard Arnold, but I couldn't do so because of his health. I always felt a little bad for Stephen Breyer at that point that, <laughs> that that's what preceded it. it. But it certainly doesn't take anything away from Stephen Breyer's career to reflect on what uh, Arnold in the Supreme Court might have looked like. I think in terms of the process, I've always taken President Clinton's words at face value, which is that the reason he didn't appoint him was because of his health. And at that point, the president had received a, a letter from, from a physician of, that had been asked to evaluate Arnold's prognosis. It was a, a very um, harshly phrased letter in a sense, and that physician would later say that it had been too conservative and too harshly phrased. But nonetheless, it was at that point that I understood President Clinton had made his decision. And his criteria, according to his criteria, then maybe that decision was, could be viewed as a correct one, which is to say, he said in his book, My Life, Clinton said, we, my Republican predecessors had appointed very young persons who would have a long lifespan. Um, I did not have that a, a promising health prognosis about Richard Arnold, and instead he appointed Stephen Breyer. He also said that he hoped he could, he could consider that Richard Arnold could be treated 
for that particular episode, and he could be considered for another opening on the Supreme Court. Another opening never came during Clinton's term. So if we go back to the criteria where Clinton is looking f at his legacy in terms of beyond his presidency, the Supreme Court nominees were Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, looking beyond that legacy, when Richard Arnold died in 2004, the, uh, his replacement would have been by a Republican president and not by a Democratic president, whereas Stephen Breyer is still there. So if, if judged by that criteria, then that's one way to do it. But I've also, I've, I've also really appreciated Paul Greenberg's sentiments that he's stated over the years about what 10 years or even one year of, Supreme, of, of Richard Arnold on the Supreme Court would have done for the, could have done for the country. One final one, then I'll let you go. Could you speculate on what might have been the Supreme Court with a Richard Arnold on the court, what it would have been like? You worked for him, what would, it, what would you? I'm, I'm hesitant to, even after working on this book for five years and reading opinions, I'm hesitant to be in a position to suggest how Richard Arnold might have voted on specific issues that came up in the Supreme Court. But I, I would say this, I think one difference is that Richard Arnold had such a, such a degree of respect from current members of the Supreme Court from both wings, if you view them as polar opposite wings, he had respect on both sides. He was also known as a, a very collegial uh, colleague working together. So I think one difference that we might have seen over 10 years is, is, is bridging the gap a bit, bringing some of the sides together keeping the rhetoric perhaps at a lower level. I certainly think that he immensely uh, regarded Antonin Scalia, and Scalia felt the same way about Richard Arnold. So there has been, it's interesting to speculate what that kind of exchange would have looked like over the years with two real intellectual giants coming from different sides of the political spectrum.